Hey everyone, uh, this is Mike Kramer of Mock Capital. Today is uh, Tuesday, October 10th. It's around 6.30 in New York time. The U.S. markets are closed for today. So tomorrow we're going to have a very busy day, actually, with the um, PPI report coming at 8.30 a.m. We're looking for a month-over-month -month increase of 0.2% in line with last month. X Food Energy and Trade, we're looking for 0.2%. Year-over-year uh, -year final demand, we're looking for one6 uh, PPI core, we're looking for an increase of 2.3% year over year, up from 2.2. PPI X Food Energy Trade year over year, we're looking for 3% in line with last month's um, reading. Then at 2 p.m., we're going to get the FOMC Fed minutes. We'll go over that in a minute. Additionally, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, you're going to have a 10 year Treasury auction. This is important because of the what we've been seeing in the action, the Treasury rate. What you're going to want to pay attention to here is the high yield rate, uh, where that comes in at versus where the market was trading at before. Uh, the three-year auction today tailed, which means that it came in above where the market was. Uh, the one issued was trading around 472, priced at 474. Bid to cover ratio came in sharply lower than last month. And so these are important ratios to be watching the high yield, the bid to cover, indirect acceptance measures, uh, the foreign demand. You know, the lower the numbers uh, for indirect and the bid to cover ratio, the worse the demand outlook is. Uh, and of course, you're going to want to, again, pay attention to where the high yield rate is. And you can do that by just looking at where the 10 year is trading roughly uh, ahead of the auction. So that will give you a sense of whether the auction is good or bad. And, and this is important largely because we're also going to have the Fed minutes at, you know, uh, at two o'clock. Like I said, uh, we'll talk about that. The Fed minutes, um, you know, I don't think there's really going to be much of surprise in there. Um, many of the FOMC uh, committee members now have come out and they've talked about, you know, either being close to or maybe one more rate hike still in the equation. But I think really the the key here is going to be in terms of, um, you know, the length of time that they think rates are going to have to be held high. And what I would pay attention to specifically is, is whether or not these minutes read dovishly, and more importantly, how the back of the yield curve acts. Because a lot of the movement we've seen uh, in the 10-year rate uh, specifically has come uh, more recently since the FOMC meeting. If we look here, this was the date of the FOMC meeting, and basically yields broke out that day um, and above 435, and we've advanced to around this 470 level. The the 10-year rate did drop pretty sharply following the uh, conflict in Israel, and that seems natural given that there's a little bit of a flight to safety given the uncertainty there. But I think what's going to be important from here is obviously how the 10-year rate uh, acts going forward. And I think if you get sort of this dovish message out of the uh, FOMC meetings, I would particularly be paying attention to where rates go. Do they go higher or do they go lower on the back of the curve? My inclination has been that the more dovish the Fed has seemed, the more we've seen rates on the back of the curve go higher. I think to compensate for the lack of the Fed's pushing through with more rate hikes. I think because you're seeing uh, Atlanta Fed GDP uh, basically modeling out the Atlanta Fed GDP now forecast is suggesting that we see uh, third quarter real GDP of about 5.2%, uh, which is a really uh, unreal GDP number for this part of the cycle, especially given how much um, we've seen in terms of rate hikes already. And additionally, what it implies is uh, a very strong U.S. nominal growth rate of about 8.9%. It also represents about a 4% uh, PCE on a quarter over quarter seasonally, annu seasonally annualized rate. Um, and so this is important stuff. And, and because if the market's perception is, is that the Fed is, you know, kind of pulling back at the wrong point in time or the market doesn't feel the Fed is being restrictive enough, then you're going to see 10-year rates eventually move higher and take out these highs. And so I think it's really important to watch uh, specifically, you know, how 10-year rates trade going into the print after the auction and then what they do after the FOMC minutes. Because again, you know, typically when you see these big type of moves and gaps, and Monday the market was closed for Columbus Day, 
uh, here in the U.S. And it wouldn't really be all that surprising, I guess, to see the you know the the actually the ten year rate trade higher and and maybe try to revisit you know this level up in here around four eighty. In fact, it almost looks like you're seeing that kind of form already with what looks like a diamond reversal pattern potentially forming down here. And it would make sense given the straight line drop to see a big advance in the 10 year rate back up to this 480 level, because I don't think that really we can conclusively say at this point that rates have really peaked, especially given the type of acceleration we've seen in the U.S. economy. Additionally, when we look at the 30 year rate, again, it's fallen to about 4.8%, but this is a level that we have that we've just recently reached. And again, we kind of stopped going down around this 480 level, which is uh, important because the 480 level uh, on some of my charts, I have it marked uh, more clearly, but on the 480 level, you can see here is a big um, level of uh, support and resistance that goes back a pretty long, t long time. Uh, you can see how important it was now three times in a row, four times going all the way back to 2009. This acted as a key level of resistance and breaking above it, I think is very significant and holding that level, I think is very significant. Um, also, you can see here that we just have held the 10 day exponential moving average. And it's been a fairly important number that we've traded around uh, on a couple of occasions. And when we have gone below it, it hasn't been for more than a couple of days. So I would watch this level here. If you break 480, I think it opens the door to further declines on the back of the curve. But again, uh, just given where the economy is, and I, I have a feeling that we're going to still see rates going higher. Uh, so I would just watch to see how these two things kind of progress. There will be a 30-year auction uh, as well on, on Thursday. And then on the two-year rate, it seems like at this point we're just kind of trending sideways. I don't really know that there's much upside left here for the, the two-year. Uh, I think it's more likely than not that the two-year is probably going to be remaining anchored around this 5% area. Just because, again, um, I, I don't really know that the Fed has really much more to go here on the upside. And it's really going to turn, unless we really see inflation really starting to beat numbers to the upside. And that's just not the case at this point. So I think resistance still kind of remains at 510. You know, clearly, if we were to break this 495, 490 region, that, that sets up to a further decline to around 475 or so. But I think we're more likely than not to stay around this 5% region. And again, this is important because what we've seen a lot of over the last couple of days is yield curve re-steepening with a bear steepener, where you basically have the 10-year rising to the 2. Um, we rose right up to this negative 25 basis points, which had been a level of resistance and support now for some time. In fact, if you go back and you look, I have this marked off. You can see that this sort of was the low back here in 2006. And so, again, uh, this is sort of important. And it almost looks at this point like we formed a double bottom in the, in this uh, 10 minus 2 spread, at least on the weekly chart. And we look at it on the daily, you can see it certainly has what looks like a double bottom here. And if you put this in and put them together, that would be a double bottom. So... Uh, this is an important level, negative 25 basis points, because clearly this could serve as your neckline if this is a, a double bottom here, which will break out probably pushing us up towards 0%. Now, the way in which that happens may make a big deal, right? Because if it's the two-year rate falling to the 10-year rate, that's going to be more indicative of a recession. If it's a 10-year rate rising to the two-year rate, that's going to be more indicative of a bear steepener, which is more about the stronger economy, Fed keeping rates higher for longer. And that's why I say it's really important to pay attention to how the market responds following the Fed. And that's another, this is another reason, another aspect why I think rates on the back of the curve here in the US are going to continue to push higher. You know, we've talked about the euro really getting beaten up against the dollar. Uh, it's basically been since uh, July 18th that the euro has just been down in a straight line. It did break this. Um, this downtrend, which I think is important. We have talked about the euro being, you know, very oversold at points, trading below its lower Bollinger Band. Certainly that's been uh, alleviated to some degree, where certainly the, the the RSI has moved back up into the mid-50s. You've seen the 
the the euro trade back up to the 20 day moving average on the Bollinger Band. So again, this is a big level because again, you can see we got up to around the 20 day moving average and that's where we failed. We got up to the 20 day moving average here and we failed. And so now we're back at the 20 day moving average and you're going to want to see whether we can push through or not and get to this 10635 region or whether or not the 20 day moving average is going to serve as resistance again and we're going to see us come back down uh, back to this 105.20 area and maybe retest, uh, at, re at least retest this breakout, which isn't unusual, which could lead to a drop back to around 105.01 or so. And, and when we look at the British pound, it's really not much different. We talked about it being oversold with the RSI. RSI now well back into the mid 50s, also at the 20 day moving average, which has been an area of uh, resistance at times. So Again, this is sort of an important level here, 122, 123-ish, because there's room to rise probably to, to around 123.60 uh, again. But if you get rates that are going to start really moving up on the back of the yield curve and the spreads between you know U.S. and German or U.S. and um, U.K. rates really start continuing to, to widen, um, that's going to basically keep you know the euro weakening versus the dollar and that's basically going to keep the pound weakening versus the dollar and you can see that the relationship has gotten all the way back to the upper end of the range but there's a there it could go much further as it did was the case back in 2019 so it's not entirely impossible that this relationship can continue to um, move up and you're seeing you know something similar with the british tenure and the u.s tenure uh, with this big rebound and this is part of the reason why you've seen the dollar strengthen so much against these two currencies if we look really just quickly at the dax it had a very big day today there's rumors going around that china may begin to re-stimulate the economy by running a budget deficit or but again you know these are all just rumors so you have to take it with a grain of salt obviously the german economy has been highly levered to china we've known that now for some time uh, and so I think at this point, you know, the big level here to watch is this one is this 15,475 area. It's certainly possible that if we can get above this level, um, that could reopen the door to, to maybe a move higher again to more significant levels, which could even lead back to a gap fill. But there's a lot of resistance along the way. You can see that we have this downtrend in place which has been here now for a while. It's been tested even a couple of times and failed. So this is a major level of resistance. This is a major level of resistance. So uh, again, uh, if we don't pass this region around 15,450 or so, and you break 15,300, that's going to result more in this decline back to 15,140 or so with another gap to fill down here. So Again, this is a somewhat big level that you're going to want to watch for tomorrow. And most importantly, you want to see real follow through. You don't want to just see a one day rally and then it comes back in um, to really make a decision in terms of more the long term. But in the short term, again, this is a, a pretty powerful area of resistance, I think. So I, I would be watching uh, this region in here and I would be watching for a breakdown in there i mean certainly when you look at you know the dax it was oversold it's not so much anymore uh when you look at the FTSE, um again it's flirting with this trend line uh unable to really give us a decisive um decision in terms of what it wants to do again a lot of miners in the FTSE 100 one of the reasons why you saw a big move today uh, obviously china stimulus would be good for them and so you got a, a big pop there. But again, this has been, uh, you know, the thing we've been talking about now for some time, and we just continue to ping pong. What's interesting here is that you, you're still making lower highs in, in a way if you don't count this, but you're making now all of a sudden potentially a higher low. And what this tells us is that we're just consolidating at this point with really no clear direction. And so, again, your resistance level remains somewhere around the 76, 76 area with your downside support still at 7,300 without really being the, the major area to watch. So I would pay attention to headlines out of China regarding stimulus 
and I would be watching these levels. So anyway, I hope this video helps you and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye.